Welcome to Art Beat, Canada's Art Pulse. I'm your host, Katie. Today, we sit with Vanessa McKernan, an artist whose journey began in the cacophony of a creative household, a milieu where music and theater reigned, but visual art quietly waited its turn. We explore the moment the Met unveil its treasures to her young eyes, igniting a latent spark. Vanessa reveals her nuanced relationship with oil painting, a medium both demanding and forgiving, and speaks of the almost mystical bond she shares with nature. This is a conversation about the spaces we create, the emotions we capture, and the ever evolving journey of an artist. Stay with us. Vanessa, hi. Hi, Katie. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Thanks so much for being with us. I'm so happy to be here. I've been enjoying listening to the podcast and was really excited to get the chance to come on. So thank you. Vanessa, I'm really curious to hear about your background. Can you share a bit about your early influences in art and how you first got started on this creative journey? I grew up in a pretty artistic household. My father was a writer. Uh, he wrote music and plays and um, was involved in theater. And I'm one of eight children. I'm the third of eight, eight children. So kind of a big, your classic, like Irish Catholic family. <laughs> and yeah, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of music in my home growing up. There's two two of us uh, in my family that don't play an instrument, and everyone else plays either piano or guitar. And I have a sister that uh, is a jazz musician and plays the upright bass. So lots of creative energy. We didn't have any visual artists in the family. My grandfather used to draw like kind of little sketches and cartoons. But yeah, other than that, it was it was mainly just music and theater. Uh, so the arts were always encouraged in my household, which was really nice. And I think being sort of one of the more introverted children in the family, I, you know, kind of gravitated, always gravitated towards drawing as a pastime. And my parents were really great about, you know, I was the kid who like at Christmas, I always got paints or pencil crayons. Uh, so it was really encouraged in my family like from an early age so there wasn't a ton of visual art or exposure exposure to visual art in my youth i would say until i was 10 or 11 uh, my family had moved to the united states we were living in connecticut uh, so that my dad could be close to new york city because he had a play uh, that was on tour down there and he moved our entire family down there to try and work and kind of live out his big dream of like becoming a producer. We all moved down there, not legally, just like got in a car and left Canada. And so I did my elementary school in the States and a really good friend of mine who was an only child, um, you know, her parents kind of took me in and would always take me on outings with her and her family and took us to the the Met one day in New York, like just for a day trip. And I think that was my first real exposure to the first time I'd been in a museum, first real exposure to, you know, exceptional oil painting. And it had a huge impact on me. Like I just remember being so blown away by I mean, specifically like impressionist and post-impressionist. I mean, they have such an amazing collection there and um, just really feeling like this was a language that in some, some part of me, like I knew I could speak, but it was like I had never been taught or given the proper tools. And I kind of held on to that. I think, you know, for many years following that, it was just kind of this it just stands out in my mind because it was a real moment of connection, like specifically to painting. And I think I was so blown away by how something so old could still be so alive and could still kind of draw out in me this great depth of feeling. Like that was just, it was so powerful. I actually went on 
in my youth. And then in high school, I went to a fine arts high school, but I was in dance again, like my family was kind of more into performing arts. So I, and my older sister was a dancer. And so I kind of just went along with what she did. And, and, um, though I didn't have any aspirations of being a dancer, I went into dance and continued to study like ballet and modern dance until I was about 18. I, when I was, I graduated high school in Toronto. I went to Cardinal Carter Academy for the Arts, which is a fine arts high school at uh, Young and Shepherd in North York. I graduated from there and wasn't sure what I wanted to study in university. You know, my family was also very like pro post-secondary education, wanted me to go to school and, and I wasn't sure what I was going to study. Again, I sort of had this sense like I was, I mean, I was like waitressing and I don't know, doing just working and saving money and feeling a bit lost. But I always had this sense that the only thing that I felt like I had never been given the chance to learn, but really wanted to learn was painting. So I put together a portfolio and applied to Concordia. And honestly, I the portfolio was so terrible and I don't say that to like be down on myself like it was really like not because for some reason I instead of submitting drawings which I had I I decided that I should paint if I was applying for painting I should paint and so I made these paintings they were terrible but <laughs> I submitted them and they let me in and they let me in late which makes me think like that I was definitely not the first pick of students that got in <laughs> But somehow I like slipped through the crack and got into the program. Yeah, that was really the start of painting. So I, you know, I didn't, I took painting, drawing and sculpture and then later on uh, printmaking. But that was where I learned to paint. And I, Concordia was kind of an interesting school because I think there was, you know, in Quebec they have CEGEP, which is like after right? They do kind of this pre-university two-year program. So I think a lot of the kids going into that school had either been in SAGEP or had been in a high school and been in the fine art program. But here I am coming in with like zero training, like outside of, you know, me and my sketchbook, like there wasn't, no one had ever taught me how to mix paint or use paint. And so I can remember vividly in my first year of painting class we were working with acrylics and the teacher came over to me and was like you know you have to add water like you have to spray your palette like I didn't even know this you have to keep your palette wet in order to keep the paint wet and and I was I remember just being so embarrassed but then you know somebody at some point said to me like but you know oil paint takes a really long time to dry and isn't going to dry out on your palette. And I was immediately like, oh, well, then I'm going to switch to oil paint. Like, what is this acrylic? You know, it's like it dries so fast. It's so frustrating. So I pretty early on switched to oils. And I will say, again, there was not a lot of technical direction. But Concordia was really great about just like giving you space and time to just do your thing. Like it was like, here's four hours in the studio do your thing. And every two months, we're going to talk about it. It really just gave me a lot of time to just kind of, you know, work on my own style, try things out, play, experiment. It was fantastic. Like it really gave me the foundation of what it meant to have a studio practice. I think that was so formative for me. And, and I learned what it was like to just like spend a lot of time in the studio and, and really developed a love for that. I also always say it was like four years of art therapy because it also felt like, yeah, just this time in my life where I was really like so many people in their early 20s coming to terms with who I was and figuring out my identity and, you know, just struggling through that. And it was really great to get to express that through painting. I've noticed and you've also briefly mentioned that you use painting and have used painting as a way to understand the world on a sort of psycho-emotional, spiritual level. How did you discover this approach and what impact has it had on your creative process? 
I grew up in a pretty busy, chaotic environment. And I think I was always kind of finding ways within this big family to kind of separate myself and have quiet time. It's like I'm sort of this classic introvert. Like I need a lot of alone time to kind of just recharge and to just feel normal. You know, like reading was a way I always had my nose in a book. Reading was a way that I would kind of just like take time on my own. And I felt like if I was reading, people tended to leave me alone. But I also, I think I also, within that family environment, and this sounds a bit strange, but I, I, I would kind of slip out into fantasy, like a kind of imaginative fantasy world a lot mentally. So I, you know, I can recall like going through an entire dinner and then at the end of the dinner, like kind of realizing that I had been sitting there and interacting, but like I had not actually mentally been present you know, in a negative sense, this is, these are like dissociative behaviors, but I think painting is, is a positive of that. Painting has become kind of, and was, you know, my whole adult life, this sort of accepted way of removing myself from the world and kind of being somewhere quiet where I can just sort of dissolve into imagination and and fantasy. So that that's definitely one one component of it. I also think that, you know, growing up and just as an individual, I'm fairly sensitive and empathetic. And I find when I am, you know, out I want out in the world. I say this as if it's like, you know, I'm not like a monk, but like I'm in the world. <laughs> like I'm out there. But it it's it's like there's a sensitivity to people and to people's emotional states that I, and I don't see this as a negative. I think it, it's like, I like having deep conversations with people. I like hearing about, I don't like chit chat. Like I like to hear about what people are kind of going through and then also kind of passing people in the street or seeing people sitting in a park or, you know, like, and wondering about what's happening in their interior world. and the studio becomes a place to kind of process what I myself am going through, but also process what I notice when I'm out in the world with other people. So it's this kind of like marriage of imaginative fantasy fictional realm. And then what I intuit or imagine are the experiences of others. And so the, the act of painting is just kind of like a place to put all of that content, not in the way that, in, in the sense that like I'm using it, but more in the sense that I need somewhere to put it. Like I, I can only exist in, in the world if I kind of have somewhere to put all of that feeling. How do you translate such complex emotions into your visual art? Like what is the process for capturing these feelings onto the canvas? I don't know that I'm actually trying to capture them in like a very literal sense. It's almost like that's the beginning for the start of a painting. So the impetus for a certain work or a certain narrative might come from an observation or a feeling or a story that I've heard from someone. And I use it almost like a crutch. It's painters talk about approaching the blank canvas like it can be it can be challenging so it's almost like that's my little way in but then I think things evolve on a completely different set of terms like where I start and where I end up are usually two very different places ideas feelings concepts like they they don't always pair up so it's like everything that I was just talking about is like the way in. And then I think that I'm using the painting to process it. And I am. But then the painting usually kind of takes you on its own journey. I guess I'm curious what happens in the in-between. Mm -hmm. Starting point to a very different finishing point. What What happens in between? I think I get really lost in the actual materials that I'm working with. So I'm really 
drawn to color and to a pretty intuitive use of color. Sometimes think about ritual in the studio and sometimes like mixing the palette is like part of a ritual. It's something that I do when I come in and it's kind of keeping my intellect busy and it's like this thing that happens. But then when I actually go to put paint onto the canvas, I often like reach for a totally different color from my pile of paints. So that, so I, again, like, so then I'm like, okay, like yellow, you know, let's say, so then I'm, I'm like putting yellow on the canvas and then that I'll start making marks with a brush and then, or I'm putting like drips of washes of color onto the canvas and I'll see a figure and I'll get a thinner brush and draw that figure out and think about like, who is this? Like, what is this gesture? Oh, what, what, what is that behind them? Like, is that a tree? Like sometimes the, the composition is just evolving alongside a more intuitive application of paint. And then if I get stuck, like sometimes I'll think to myself, okay, wait, like what, what was this about initially? Like what was the narrative or the feeling or the thought you came in with? So that initial entry point is there as a framework, but then there's this whole other thing happening like in the process of actually just putting paint down. And I think like it's taken me a lot of years. I don't know that I would speak this way about painting like 10 years ago. Like it's it's taken me a lot of years to just like respect that and just let it be because I think I used to, I would say to myself like, no, that's not the original idea. No, that doesn't look like the thing that you're at, that you actually set out to to make today. That doesn't really look like a figure sitting at a table or or whatever it is, you know, and I would kind of shush like that little voice that's like trying to put this other thing onto the canvas. And now I've learned to just go with it, like just say yes to whatever little voice is pushing you in whatever direction and kind of let it be what it wants to be. Because it's a far that's a, that's a far more int- for me, it's a far more interesting way to paint you know when I talk about this idea of or this title of being like a studio painter like or you know kind of more devoted to the practice than than the thing than the output this is sort of what I'm talking about it's like all I really care about all I'm really interested in right now is just like being in that mysterious space where I'm kind of tapping into something that's like unknown or half known and I'm just seeing what comes. So that's like the first, I would say, you know, third or half of kind of what is on the canvas. And then of course, like with oil paint, you you build layers generally. So once I kind of have the drawing kind of comes and I have the composition, then there's these like secondary and tertiary like layers that are going on that are much more about like a finished thing. So the color will the I then I feel like I'm correcting the palette okay like is there a light source here like where where do I want the light to be coming from in this painting or because sometimes just getting the sketch down and when I'm playing with color the color ends up a little bit muddy or it's it's just you know the palette needs some working and then once I feel like I have the drawing of the piece I'm in that intuitive process I have the drawing down so to speak, then I'll kind of polish the palette a little bit more. When you're finished for the day, how do you get back into that headspace the next day? Yeah, I don't always. I think that's, yeah, I <laughs> think that's, sometimes I walk back in the next day and there's just like an intense wash of disappointment. <laughs> almost like, oh, wow, yesterday this was like everything and it was like oh I was really getting somewhere and today I'm I'm nowhere so what I usually do then if I if I rock in and the composition feels I feel like defeated or it's it doesn't resonate I don't work on it like I'll just put it aside and I'll work on something else and I and I do generally have like three or four pieces going at a time so I'll move something to the side and then start something else then there are times when I come in I can actually see more clearly like I'm sort of halfway through the drawing and then I I'm I can think to myself oh my gosh like this is what 
this is, like this is what this story is, and then I can get further into it. So it's pu- it's push and pull. It's like things are working, things aren't working. It's kind of back and forth. And some pieces, if I'm really lucky, like I feel like there was a painting that was at the artist project called Death in the Garden. Yeah, that I worked on. And I worked on two canvases that size at the same time. And that painting, the composition I had actually painted in a really tiny little like nine by 12 a year earlier. And somebody had been talking to me about that painting. And I was thinking about it again and thinking like, oh, that was such a great composition. And there was so much there. Like I should really give it a chance in larger format and see what happens. And So it was nice that I sort of already had the basic composition in this smaller piece. I mean, the larger piece became a very different painting, but it it still retains some of the same, like, woman in the corner covering her face, tree, field. Like, there's some similar uh, subjects within the canvas. And that was quick. That was like, I knew what the drawing was, so I just got more into the painting and the brushwork and the palette. And the composition wasn't as much of a struggle. You know, I'll go back and forth for they they can it it can be months, you know, or or it sits in the studio for weeks, and then I turn it upside down, and it's and I paint something. Sometimes turning the the canvas helps also to see something new in it, and then rework it that way. How do you decide when a painting is truly finished, especially when it's so tied to your let's say, emotional and spiritual journey. I'm trying to think if there's a painting that I've finished that then stayed with me, like in my studio that I didn't go back at. Generally, it's finished when it's not with me anymore. Like once it's gone, if it's on someone's wall, like I can't touch it. (laughs) And so that's uh, that's when it's done. I'm never going to get that piece back. But if the painting is in my home or in my studio, I always, I always go back at it, which is like, you know, I know people kind of cringe when I say that sometimes, but like I have a big piece. I moved to it and near home like last year and hung like a four by four foot canvas in my kitchen. And every day I'm just like, oh my God, if only I could just... Like, I, I want to bring it back into the studio. And not that I would paint something completely different over top of it, but I feel like there's areas within the canvas that could be worked a little bit more. But also, I mean, these oil paintings, it's like they're chameleons. Like, you get, and maybe this is just with any painting, like, you get a painting into a different room with different lighting and different wall colors, and the, the whole painting changes. Mm-hmm. So it's like they, they're always changing. I think also I don't have, and I sort of like this, I don't work with controlled lighting in my studio. It's a lot of just natural light that's like dark on a rainy day and clouds are rolling in and there's sun and then there's no sun. And so it's the the lighting in the studio is always changing too. So sometimes I think something is finished or polished and then I'll see it later in the day and and rework part of it so yeah I guess the answer to that question is that they're never they're never really done until they're gone until they're sold what do you think it is that keeps you wanting to rework them and keep adding and changing Mm, this gets yeah I think this gets a little like psychoanalytical but (laughs) <laughs> it's, yeah, I think there's definitely an element of like destruction there. I think it's wanting to destroy the thing that maybe just somehow I feel isn't good enough. Also feeling like I can improve it. Like, oil painting is like this lifelong journey. Like I will probably be making my best work when I'm like 80 or, you know, I think it's, I still feel so young with it. And I feel like I'm always learning more and getting better control of how I apply paint and how I use color. It's maybe thinking that I can make this thing better, which doesn't mean that I am. Like, I I, I know I can also accept that I'm doing damage and and should maybe be walking away. But that's, yeah, that's hard for some reason. It's hard. Your work so beautifully explores the human condition. What initially drew you to this theme? I think when I started out painting 
and drawing. I mean, when I was in university, I would do a ton of figure drawing. Like most of the painting and drawing courses I took were figure related. I would go to the free life drawing sessions. I think after spending so many years in dance studios, like looking at bodies and looking at moving bodies, like I just had a real interest in the human form and in drawing the human form. You know, as someone who's fairly sensitive and also as someone who comes from a big family, just as an individual and as a young person, I think I was preoccupied with how other people were feeling. It's not so much of a decision to paint the human condition and then acting that out, but more that my circumstances in life and my interest in the figure led to paintings that now looking at them, I think that's what I'm painting about. That's what I'm interested in. You know, it's, it's relationship. It's relationship with ourselves, our relationships with each other. And also, I mean, especially recently, our relationship with nature. I just think it's, it's an area of interest that has kind of endless, infinite possibility. So far, I, it's, it's not something that I'm bored of. Like it's, it's still, it's still fascinating to me. And it's interesting too, to try and talk about it in a wordless way, I think, because we do so much talking about investigation of our understanding of the human condition in all these other verbal ways. It's, um, it's different. And I think to me, you know, of course, I mean, I'm, I'm a visual artist, but to me, it's more powerful to talk about it this way, to think about it this way and to express it in painting in a visual form. I feel like your paintings often tap into the collective unconscious. How do you achieve that balance between the personal and universal in your work? I think I approach, I always approach the work from the level of personal. That's, that seems the most authentic way in to the work. And I, I think the most simple, like, I, I, you know, I know myself, I know my own experience. It's a place to start. I think the expansion to kind of more universal ideas or themes is is a byproduct. And I think for me, kind of something that I noticed in hindsight, like after making the work and having to write about the work or writing grant applications about the work, kind of like noticing that and thinking about it. So it's not necessarily the, the, the universal is not necessarily the intention or what I'm, where I start or what I'm kind of working to achieve. I mean, it just comes, it comes from the personal because we all share in so many, so many parts of the human experience and the human condition, right? These are not, the feelings that I feel are not entirely unique. So I think it's, it's that, it's just, it goes outward from there. Within your work, are there any sort of recurring symbols or motifs that you use to represent either personal or these universal human experiences? Looking back on the work, and now that I'm this many years in, I can see themes, I can see recurring symbols and motifs that kind of continually pop up. You know, I talk to my, my youngest sister and I talk about this a lot. I feel like there's like two types of people in the world. Like you either think about death or you don't. And like, if you're, if you're someone who thinks about death, you think about death like every day. And that can sound really dark, but I don't, I mean it not in the sense that you think about necessarily your own death. Though, of course, like I, I do think about that, but I think about just death in general, like death of the people around me, and death as a, it's just kind of this, it's like, it's, it's just present. So I, I think there's, I think that's a theme that comes, something that I'm always kind of working with. And also then more specifically, it's that the, the whole cycle. So birth, you know, life, death, rebirth, kind of this, the cycle of life, 
So that's definitely there in a lot of my paintings. And it can be a little bit hard to say that <laughs> because it's, and I sometimes I feel like I have to sort of water that down for people when I'm talking to them about my work. Maybe a better way to put it is just our, like our, our own mortality. You know, we are here for a very short period of time that provides a lot of context to my own that knowledge provides a lot of like the awareness of my own mortality just informs how I live my life and how I see the world sleeping figures you know I'm my figures are often eyes closed there's you know which for me is like a reference to sleep a reference to death a way of thinking about dreams, a way of thinking about kind of other mental states of being, floral motifs and elements from the natural world, trees and grass and fields and meadows, water that comes up in my work a lot. Water specifically was something that I became interested in painting after I gave birth. I had my first son, Jules, in 2016. was making paintings about bodies of water and rivers and thinking about the connection of rivers to all of the rivers that are flowing inside the body of a mother, a postpartum body, and a, you know, thinking about the connection between the natural world and the inner workings of the body. So that was the, you know, for many years I was painting a lot of these like figures in ponds and in rivers and in water. And then, you know, the floral elements in my work, the garden has been a theme and a subject that I've been exploring the last couple of years. Again, you know, gardens are such a great representation of the cycle of life playing out. So seed to plant, to flower, to fruit, to decay, uh, to dormancy, you know, these things and the way they grow becomes kind of this great symbol for our own lives and our, you know, the mortality of the human person. I think also the, the garden, I started making these garden paintings in 2022 when I was living in the city. Like I painted most of these paintings at like Carla and Queen in like a 200 square foot <laughs> like tiny studio um, with no air conditioning and next to like <laughs> next to a busy street and I think they were an escape of sorts like I think it was like kind of post-pandemic really feeling I've started to feel really trapped in the city actually I think in general i so I was making these paintings. I didn't view them as this at the time, but I think they were very much escapist. And they, they ended up being these paintings of like, you know, figures having these sort of quiet moments of like revelation and surrender. And like, they're very contemplative. I'm still in the garden, I think in my work very much that, you know, and now I've moved, I, I did leave Toronto and moved to the Ottawa Valley in the summer of 2023. So I eventually did feel so stuck that I was like, we're leaving, <laughs> moved my family and, and it's, you know, been a really big change, but I think it's, you know, now I'm actually, you know, I, I have a garden and we bought a little bit of land that we bought it in the winter. So I didn't really know what was here. And this is, it's been really interesting to see kind of what's growing here. So it's funny. It was like, I was making these paintings and then I feel like I, I moved into the painting almost somehow. So now I'm going to start painting cities. I particularly enjoy how your paintings seem to hold their own narratives created from obviously your personal experiences and dreams, but I also know that some come from stories from loved ones. How do you decide which to incorporate into your paintings? Sometimes I'll be interested in a story or I'll, you know, I'm, I make notes. I definitely make notes and I journal and I'll be, you know, out or driving or walking and, and have an idea for a painting and and jot it down. 
sometimes things take like a year or two to kind of show up in the studio or show up in a painting. I think I've always been a lover of story in general. Like I mentioned reading a lot when I was young and I still read quite a bit and I listen to audio books a lot while I paint. And I love the way that, you know, story and like a good story can really kind of haunt your psyche. Like when you're reading something really good and you put the book down and you go to like go to work or whatever, but you kind of can't shake the mood or the feeling or the world of that of that book. I think it can happen with film and television too, maybe. But I mean, again, this is like another 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 way of dissociating. But like, it's I love being immersed in a story, and so in my paintings and in when I'm in the studio working on a painting, I feel a little bit like I'm chasing narrative. Like I'm there's something there, there's a story there, and I'm 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 trying to find it. You know, I'm like who is this? What is this about? And it's, it feels, it has that similar feeling of a really good book, like where I, I get kind of haunted by, by the painting or by the feeling in the painting that I'm chasing. In terms of the narratives that I might start with, like I talked about working from personal experiences or dreams or stories, I guess I'll speak to the, the painting in the woods or Goya's goat was the a painting that I showed at the artist project. And that painting, it's it's actually kind of a really good classic example of sort of how how the narrative came together. Um, one of my best friends lives in Bermuda and she lost her mother years ago to cancer. And I think she struggled obviously like the grieving process was long and hard. Many years later, for a myriad of reasons, she ended up taking care of these herds of goats. It was sort of a farming project with her and someone else on the island. A handful of the goats ended up getting sick and dying and she had to kind of, she was kind of there for that process and sort of experienced that with these goats. But I think like in that process and I don't even know if this is something she would say this is like how I read it it was like she actually got to grieve the loss of her mother and so I had asked her you know I was like can you send me some photos of your goats like you know I would love I feel like this would make such a beautiful painting so I was thinking about Megan as her name I was thinking about Megan's story and so I had these images of goats and then I was I like to also of course, when you when you paint and when you paint with oils, like you're always kind of tapping into this huge, massive history. You know, the history of oil painting is so vast. And and I sort of love that because I feel like it's like I'm getting to connect with like the ghosts of all these all the painters before me. So I kind of always like to go back and look at historical artworks of the subjects that I'm interested in. And so I found this image of a Goya painting called, I think it's called Witch's Sabbath. And it's, you know, in, in his painting, the goat, the shadow of this goat figure is like the representation of the devil. And there's like, it's a very like moody scene. And there's all these witches like cowering away from this goat figure. And so then I was, you know, just thinking about the goat was kind of like a shadow in the Goya painting. And I was thinking, I think a lot about, you know, shadow selves and our own shadow selves and being kind of this idea of the parts of ourselves that we don't really want to look at. And so in the painting, I had this central figure. And then I thought, what if I incorporate like this goat from the Goya painting? And it ended up, it's in the foreground, but to me, it was kind of like the shadow of the central figure, which I guess in its origin is Megan, but it doesn't actually look like Megan. Like I'm not trying, it's not a portrait. And because I'm now thinking about shadow selves, it also becomes about my own experience with that. And and then the other goat, the goat from the images Megan had sent me was, I think, I guess female, like didn't have the horns and is further in the background, like eating from a tree. So there's sort of this loose narrative. There's this feeling from this beautiful story of my friend. 
Then there's like the incorporation of these are historical images. And I kind of just like sit with all that and paint. And then in the end, you know, the painting, that's sort of where the narrative ended there. The painting stopped there. I didn't feel, I wasn't so sure about, it's a very busy painting. Like there's a lot of brushwork and I kind of wondered if I should, you know, tone some of that down. And, um, but I, it's always great to show the, show the paintings and get feedback on them. And I showed the painting at Artist Project and someone really connected with it and bought it. And, and I think to that point, it's like, I have my own intention for it in the studio when I make it. And then the painting has a whole other life once it's out in the world and people see it. And, and I think the person that bought it, like connected to it for her own set of reasons that are unknown to me, but it's, I do wonder like what, what she saw, you know, she looked a little bit like the figure in the painting. Actually, she had like dark curly hair. Yeah. Vanessa, I'm curious to hear some of your perspectives on the Canadian art scene, such as how do you see our Canadian art scene evolving in the next few years? Interesting, because I feel like my my answer takes two totally opposite views. On the one hand, I think just globalization in general means that it matters kind of less and less where you are. I think there's so many incredible programs, classes, critique critique groups, like so many things happening post-pandemic online that anyone can kind of access. And, and I think because of social media and the internet, we kind of have more you know, easier channels of communication with the global art, art scene or art scenes in other cities. And so I think that's really encouraging and interesting, or that's kind of where my, where my thinking is right now. I really, you know, love that about, about the world in general. And then I think also post COVID, you know, there's this other return towards like real community-based activity. And again, maybe I'm speaking more about where where I'm at personally, because these two things are kind of happening simultaneously for me. I think, you know, generally we're just excited to be able to see each other again and gather again. And I think there's kind of a new energy and new vigor and, you know, people are more interested in going to openings and getting community events organized. You know, personally, it's something I'm interested in, in my new space. Like I'm thinking about starting life drawing group sessions in my studio. And so I think, yeah, there's also kind of this return to kind of small scale community stuff happening um, within Canada, within Toronto and maybe hopefully Ottawa now that I'm, I'm closer to this city. Are there any changes that you would like to see for Canada to better support its artists? I think that in terms of government grants, we're actually a pretty well-funded country. You know, when I, you know, when you talk to people that live in the States and like, I think we actually have really good um, grant programs. That's something we have working for us. The change that I kind of hope for and wish that I would see more of, and it is really wishful thinking, I think is actually in like the viewership and the Canadian public. And I think that people are here and, you know, we're a very young country. We don't have, you know, this isn't Europe. Like we don't have kind of even the history of looking and seeing that maybe other areas of the world do. But I I think that Canadians really need to trust themselves more, be willing to take a risk about on on what they look at, what they support, what they hang on their walls. I, you know, that that's my wish. My wish is that we can see more movement from the general public in in what they're interested in and what they're willing to look at. I think that like it's so slow to change and it's like the kind of like Canadiana art aesthetics that are out there. Like 
will not die, like are just not dying. And I, it's just, and I don't even know how, how something like that happens, but I, I just, I wish for more of that. I wish for like openness from the public. Do you have any idea of like what it would take to help start to shift that mindset? I mean, it must be like, there must be a slow shift happening on some level. But yes, I think I do. I think that the, that it's the artist's responsibility to shift that. I think that so many people pick up a brush and go to paint and tend towards this style that they've seen or that they know. And of course, like I'm, I'm not we all we all start by impersonating and i did that too to some extent like you know that's okay it's it's we learn how we learn but i think like for an artist when you reach a certain point where you start to find your voice like don't don't silence yourself in order to sell more work or don't don't make your unique voice smaller or quieter to satisfy this public that that can't handle that only wants to see something they've already seen it's like follow you know like take hold of take charge take hold of your individuality and like just try and um listen to your own voice i think that's we kind of have to dictate that and then the public will be forced to follow i guess so vanessa what's next for you yeah, it's a really exciting time for me right now. I just uh, moved, left Toronto and moved to a uh, property in the Ottawa Valley where I renovated an old dilapidated indoor pool into a studio space. So I have, uh, I think it's around a thousand square feet now to work in, which is just like such a dream come true. I put all my savings into this renovation and I just got heat in there in the winter. So it's, I'm just sort of six months in to working in the space. Um, so my next year, and I, I got a grant from the, a second grant from the Elizabeth Greenshields Foundation, specifically going towards kind of just 12 months of studio practice and just being in this space, responding to the natural environment around me and producing a new body of work or multiple bodies of work over the next year. When this podcast airs, we'll have just had a show close at Spence Gallery. So I'm heading into another production phase and I have a handful of six by six foot stretchers in my kit in my studio that I'm planning on preparing and just working on kind of these large format paintings over the next, you know, when I take on paintings that size. I like to give myself a good six months with them. So I'll be working on that through the summer and into the fall. And then I'm planning on having an open studio event in the fall in my new space to invite everyone in to see it. Um, so that's what's happening here in Ottawa. And then I have uh, work being shown with Spence Gallery at the Seattle Art Fair in July and at the Affordable Art Fair in New York in September. And where can our listeners find your work? I'm pretty active on Instagram. So my cheesy handle is Vainter, which is painter with a V. I think if you also just search my name, Vanessa McKernan on Instagram, my account will come up. My website is, again, a really great resource. All of my work is there and also a little shopping section with limited edition prints. And the website is just vanessamckernan.com. Vanessa, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, Katie. It's such a good conversation. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Artbeat, where the stories of Canadian art come to life. Follow us on Instagram at Artbeat Podcast for exclusive content and previews of what's to come. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform to stay updated with our journey through the world of Canadian art. Enjoyed the episode? Leave a review or recommend us to a fellow art enthusiast. Together, let's keep the conversation going and deepen our connection to the diverse world of Canadian art. See you next time.